Hi, Marilyn here. In this video, we're going to tackle the problem of how to choose an image to paint, and I'll share some ways that might make it easier to actually paint it. Back. I have a confession. I have an addiction. I have an addiction to taking photos, photos of things that I'm absolutely certain I'm going to paint. And then I realize I have hundreds of photos and I can't decide which one. There's also another problem. I might decide on an image, but I can't seem to actually get started getting it on paper. If you're in the same boat, stick around because I'd like to share with you how I deal with the problem of too many images and the related problem of actually getting started. Does this sound like you? You have hundreds, maybe thousands of photographs on your camera roll. Um, you printed out many, many of them. They're in a basket or a file folder or a notebook. And all of them are yelling at you, paint me, paint me. I mean, you took the photograph for a reason, right? There was something about that image that was calling to you. But now you're kind of stuck and that's what happens to me. I have so many images, it's hard to decide which one to paint. Well, here's what works for me and maybe it will work for you. I found that if I set some criteria, it's easier to make a choice. So the first thing I do is narrow the field. I look across all the photographs and I try to pick five or six that are calling my name more than the others, that are essentially saying, please paint me now. The second thing I do is to look across those five or six photographs and see where there are some interesting shapes. Now the shape could be the subject or it could be an interesting shadow shape. The third thing I do is totally unscientific. I do a gut check. I try to think about what emotion am I feeling? What am I feeling when I look at these five or six paintings and which one seems to generate the strongest response? Is it the result of a memory of when I took the photo? Is it the colors seem to really speak to me? Or <clears throat> maybe it's just I look at the image and I think, wow, I have never painted anything like this before. This could get really exciting and I pick one. I know that all those other photographs are gonna be waiting there patiently for me the next time I'm looking for inspiration. So let me walk you through how this worked for this particular painting of yellow tulips that I did about a month ago. I love to paint flowers. I have hundreds and hundreds of photographs on my camera roll of images that I hope to use as a reference for a painting. Of those hundreds, I realized I have 19 photographs of these yellow tulips. Now these yellow tulips were given to me by a very, very special friend. So right there, there's an emotional tie to uh, that particular image. Of the 19, I realized there were four that had some kind of interesting shadow shapes and one in particular really stood out as a great candidate for a good painting. And that's how I chose it. Now comes the challenging part. How do we move from one photograph to actually painting that image? The second problem is a little more difficult for me. I've chosen an image and now I have to actually paint it. And I think some of that comes from a lack of confidence and being victim of uh, precious paper paralysis, something we talked about in an earlier video. So let me share with you something that seems to be working for me right now, uh, where I am in my art journey, and maybe it will work for you. So step one has to do with getting rid of the noise. So this is the photo that I chose. But there's lots of other distractions in this. There's a barbecue grill. There's the, um, the supports for the screen uh, on the patio. There's a bird bath. There's the arm of one of the chairs. And I am not going to tackle teeny tiny gingham for the tablecloth. So the first thing that I do, step number one, is to get rid of the noise. And the way I do that is to print out that photograph on copy paper, not glossy photo paper. 
just regular copy paper. And then I take gesso and I paint around the whole subject and I get rid of all the background noise. So I've gotten rid of the edge of the table. No longer is there a distraction here with the bird bath and the screen and the barbecue grill. And what I found is some very interesting shapes that I couldn't see because the background was so distracting. You'll notice I didn't include the edge of the table. Um, I'm pretty sure that I want to change that when I paint it. But for right now, what I'm trying to get to is this big shape. I painted right over the shadow. I'm fairly certain that I can design an interesting organic shape that will uh, capture that shadow and make it, make it interesting for me. But that's the first step, is to get rid of the noise. Now, if you don't have gesso, you can take that paper copy and just cut it out and tape it to a piece of white paper. And that way you get the same effect. You're just getting rid of all the distraction. Now, I did save the shadow shape because I might want to go back and look at it again. But step number one, get rid of the noise and all the things that distract you. Step two is to find the big shape. So I take that paper copy that I've gessoed or taken away all the distraction and using a straight edge and a red marker or a red pencil, I box it in. So I go to the bottom edge all the way across. I go to the farthest edge on either side and the top edge. And now I can look at this and see that I don't have a square. I don't have a tall skinny rectangle. I have kind of a chubby rectangle. And I know that if I, regardless of the size of paper that I use, if I place that chubby rectangle on the paper first, then I can begin to sketch within that grid. Now sometimes I'll actually go in with a marker and eyeball the midpoint both horizontal, horizontally and vertically and add some dotted lines to just give me one more level of reference. Now when I go to sketch this, I can see where the big shapes are and I can begin to determine where does this tulip intersect with this line? How big of a shape is this? And what is this shape that's happening here? And again, I have this wonderful uh, shape in the middle. So step number two is find the big shape. Step number three is to sketch and sketch again and maybe even sketch again. I started out by doing some thumbnails that gave me a sense of where the darks and the lights might be and what kind of composition I might like to use for this. And I'm thinking as I look at these that I'm probably going to go with the vase pushed to the right side of the frame and I'm going to lower the edge of the table. Still gives me plenty of room for shadow. But I can play around with this in small thumbnail sketches which allow me to see what's the balance of lights and darks. But I also do color sketches. So I have these little what I call my workhorse sketchbooks and this is just made with um, sheets of watercolor paper that I, I cut up a full sheet. So I painted this version. Um, again, I was just kind of experimenting. What I realized was that I didn't get that interesting shape that's kind of in the middle of the petals. I gave it another go. This one's closer to what I hope to end up with. I'm thinking that I can um, use that dark background to pop out those yellow tulips. And I had an opportunity to kind of play around with how might those um, checks play out on that table. Interesting, this sketch was done in 2017, so I told you I've been thinking about this one for a while. I also like these little cheapo sketchbooks that I buy at the local craft store. They're only about five bucks. And um, I did another sketch. I wanted to see what might it look like if I had a red tablecloth. 
Again, the sketching allows me to build some confidence with the subject so that by the time I get to the paper, it's not quite so frightening. So step number three, sketch and sketch a lot. The next thing I do is begin to think about the color scheme that I would like to have. What's the palette going to be? And I have learned over the past few years that I work much better with a limited palette. So I always choose a red, a blue, and a yellow from which I can mix all the colors that I might want to include in my painting. For me, that works well because if I get slap happy with choosing lots of different colors, I generally end up with mud. Now, one of the things that I do, this is another um, workhorse sketchbook, is I play around with colors. And so I'll pick a red and a yellow and a blue and see what other shades I can come up with. So in this case, in, when I don't have anything to paint, I just paint paint. So for this painting, I'm thinking that this red and this yellow and this blue can form the basis for my painting. I know that when I mix this and this, I'm going to get some shades of orange that might work well in the dark spots of my tulips. I also know that when I mix this yellow with this blue, I'm going to get this beautiful shade of green that can be the foundation for the foliage. And because I'm already thinking that I probably am going to have a very dark violet background, I know that if I mix this red with this blue, I can get a nice violet that I can deepen enough to make that background that I'm looking for. So that's an important step. Step number four, decide on your colors and try to work with a limited palette so you avoid the chance of making mud. Step five is sketching your subject onto your watercolor paper or your canvas. Here's how I tackle that. I use this uh, grid that I created earlier on the gessoed copy and I go back to thinking about that fat rectangle and on my watercolor paper regardless of the size what I'm trying to do is place that fat rectangle where I think it would best suit my design. So I lightly sketch that that rectangle and I know I want it to the right side of my paper. And now I have some place to add the rest of the sketch. Using this as a reference, I begin to think about the shapes and I sketch in that shape. You'll notice I've added a line for the table because um, I decided I wanted to lower it. It was following the same line as the top of the vase and that didn't look so good. So I've lowered the line of the table, but now I can go in and on my watercolor paper, I can use this as a reference to sketch where I want to paint. Now that big rectangle or that fat rectangle allows me to see things like this triangle and the jagged edges of the tulips. Now I'll tell you, I'm not counting how many points there are on these uh, flowers. That's not what I'm interested in. If I wanted it to look exactly like the photo, I would have just framed the photograph. But I'm using this to kind of get an idea of there is a triangle up here in this corner that I want to capture when I sketch for my watercolor. I also want to make sure that I pay attention to how far over from the midline does it take for this flower to intersect with the side. So again, I'm thinking about big shapes. I'm not really drawing a vase, I, or I'm not really drawing flowers. I'm drawing the shape that creates those. The important thing for me, and this is what I kept missing in earlier versions, was this really cool shape right here in the middle and how it translates down below into the, into the vase. So that's something that I wanna make sure that I capture when I take um, my sketch actually to the watercolor paper. I have a lot more confidence when I've done this so that I can do this part with some measure of success. Step number six is really important if you are a watercolorist. If you paint in oil or acrylic, this may not be as critical for you, but it might be worth paying attention to. As a watercolorist, I have to save the white of the paper to be my lightest value. 
And as we talked about in an earlier video, I'm always trying to play with that full range of value from the darkest dark to the lightest light. Once I put paint on the white of the paper, it is extremely difficult to ever recover that nice bright white again. So when I'm sketching and working from my reference, I actually go in and think about where do I want some whites? I know that this tablecloth has a lot of white in it. And on my watercolor paper, I might even make a note, W. And that's going to remind me when I start slinging paint that I need to save some of those whites. Now I also know if there's a shadow here, I know that the light is coming from this direction. So there are going to be some light spots along these edges. And I might go in and make myself little notes just so I know where I want to leave some white sparkle of the paper. But that's an important step, especially if you're a watercolorist. Step number seven. Now we get to paint. One of my instructors at Dunedin Fine Arts Center likes to say, you need to plan like a turtle so you can paint like a rabbit. Well, we've been doing a lot of turtle work and now it's time to be the rabbit. First thing that I do, remember I sketched out lightly in pencil that fat rectangle and that's what I built my sketch on. Well, I want to go in now with a kneaded eraser and I want to get rid of that rectangle. Yellow paint is kind of funny in that once you put paint over it, it's almost impossible to get rid of your pencil lines. So I want to make sure I have as few lines here as possible. I'm not erasing the tulip lines. Those are going to be a grid for me and I don't care if some of my marks show through. That's kind of my uh, signature as an artist. So I've gotten rid of the sketch of the circle and now what I'm going to do, I have my blue, my red, my yellow and I'm going to cover this paper with water. I'm going to try to remember where I had those white places. I know that in the middle I have a big patch of yellow and I don't care if some of that white shows through because those might be the sparkles that I need to indicate that the light's coming in. Now remember I'm going to use the yellow and my blue to make my green so I'm just going to throw some blue in there and let those things get married and kind of see what happens. If some of the paint ends up down here on the tablecloth I'm not too worried about it. I really want to make sure that I have created a harmonious playground for these colors to play together. Now I did say I chose some red and I do want to make sure that there's a little bit of that in there someplace. So let's make sure that the brush is clean and we'll just throw in some red, let that dance around a little bit and that's it. Now that may look like chaos to you right now but I have just taken away the fear of that white paper, the fact that I think it's so precious. There's already paint. It's kind of like the step we looked at in um, the paper paralysis episode about um, messing up the page. So I've messed up the page. I have the colors that I'm ultimately going to use in my painting and now I can get down to the serious part of creating those tulips in a vase on a tablecloth. And that's how I tackle this whole problem of going from many, many, many photographs to one photograph to actually getting started on a piece of paper. I hope that was helpful for you and that you'll subscribe to this channel and I hope to see you again real soon. Bye.